What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in true crime. We're coming to you at a new time, and that is because the great Carm, my beautiful mother, who is 83, and correcting everyone, because in two weeks' time, she turns 84, and she says she wants respect, uh, she's overseas and so we are accommodating her Carm how's it feel to be back Carm it feels wonderful wonderful last week I was at the wedding so I couldn't make it and I missed it I like show business and uh, I love that you're here I would have appreciated a more um, dynamic background but I will take the uh, plain white vanilla cupboards for now um Today, everyone, this is a very interesting story. We're looking at the 30-year unsolved murder of rising Hollywood music executive Brett Cantor. Brett was brutally stabbed to death back on July 30th, 1993. Find out why one intrepid investigator and a profiler are still on the case and how actress Rose McGowan and even O.J. Simpson are sort of part and not part of this sordid story, why they are indirectly and directly involved. Our best guest here today at the bottom of the screen, the man in the plaid shirt, that is Pat Tapia. He is a 38-year law enforcement veteran of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. His previous experience includes working nine years as an elite member of the Homicide Bulldogs. It's one of the most recognized law enforcement insignias in the nation investigating high-profile murder cases, gang-related murders, murder-suicides, arson, and elder abuse deaths. Garm, cover your ears on that one. Uh, he worked alongside other homicide detectives like Gil Carrillo, who solved the infamous Night Stalker case. And then the other gentleman who's got the sort of the cigar bar background that I love so much, that is Paul Delhauer. He is a consultant and crime scene reconstruction expert specializing in evidentiary review and analysis of deaths and incidents of violence, including murders and officer-involved shootings. He is a certified criminal investigative analysis with over 28 years of law enforcement experience, also with the L.A. County Sheriff's Department and six years, 16 years with the Sheriff's Homicide uh, Bureau. And he was assigned to the unsolved team in October of 1999 uh please follow us on facebook insta twitter we are podcast sts on insta i just posted pictures of detective phil waters who has uh, investigated over 400 homicide cases for the houston pd uh he was once upon a time an undercover narcotics uh officer and he sent me some sort of hilarious photos of him with a mullet from the 80s, and they are on Instagram at Surviving the Survivor. Uh, you can support us at Patreon and uh, on YouTube. The merch store is open. Carm, do you have a fly on your keyboard? What are you looking at there? I'm looking that I can hear you, but usually you yell, and now you are whispering. Ah, well, keep your ears open. So okay. uh, without, without further ado, let me kind of set the backdrop here, and we're going to get into this. Detective Tapia and Paul Delhauer, they've spent the last uh, three years of this 30-year escapade investigating the mysterious unsolved murder of Brett Cantor. He was an a and executive for Chrysalis Music. Uh, he was co-owner, Brett Cantor was, of the Hollywood nightclub called Dragonfly, and he was dating actress Rose McGowan at the time of his death. Uh, his life obviously took a tragic turn, 30 years ago, almost to the day, on July 30th, 1993, when he was found murdered in his apartment. His case remains unsolved to this day. Uh, and Pat and Paul's cold case investigation is going to be featured in the upcoming True Crime podcast series. And it is called Dragonfly, Brett Cantor Murder Mystery. It is called Dragonfly, Brett Cantor Murder Mystery, co-produced with Case File Presents, and the podcast will premiere on July 18th, uh, and it'll be on Apple, Spotify, and all major streaming uh, platforms. Um, Brett, incidentally, was the son of a music manager named Paul Cantor, who had managed Dionne Warwick's career 
for 19 years. Um, Pat, before we get into this, um, so you guys debuted this series in 2021. You're now going to have new interviews and uh, a whole new rollout of this podcast, uh, July 18th. Um, how is Brett's family doing 30 years later? Are you in touch with them? Uh, yes, we are. We're in touch with uh, the mom, Ronnie, and the brother, Mark. And uh, as a matter of fact, we're supposed to be meeting them this uh, next weekend just to go over some stuff and to have lunch. But uh, she's hanging in there. Ronnie's hanging in there. She's uh, in her uh, mid to late 80s. And she's just hoping that maybe we could get enough information so that uh, the case could be solved. And the brother, Mark, he's uh, doing well. He keeps in contact with a lot of people that uh, they used to hang out with back then. And he also is trying to uh, help solve uh, his brother's murder. And um, the father did pass away, right? I think he, he passed yes, away. He yeah, okay. So he is would not. The, is the brother the one who found him? No, the brother who found him, his name is Cliff, and he has also passed away since uh, Brett's oh. murder. Wow. So how many um, siblings remain? How many siblings does Brett have still? Uh, he has one, Mark. Mark and the mother, correct? Yeah, correct. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, Pat, to you, back to you, um, you were qu quoted in an article I read uh, as saying that family and friends describe Brett as a very charismatic young man, a rising Hollywood music producer and nightclub promoter. Uh, he had a lot going for himself and he was on his way to becoming legendary like his father. Tell us, just paint the picture a little bit, if you can, of Brett in this period of time. Uh, he and I are rough. I think he was a couple of years older than myself, but early 90s, um, sort of the grunge era of music with guys like uh, Nirvana getting big. But what, what was he up to? He was from L.A. and j just kind of set the stage, if you don't mind, a little bit. Sure. When Brett was in high school, he was going to uh, Beverly Hills High with uh, uh, several other uh, celebrities. And a couple of them were very infamous, which would be the, uh, the brothers who killed their uh, uh, parents way back in in the uh, 90s also. And, Lionel uh, Hernandez? Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, um, and so after high school, uh, Brett had some difficulties with narcotics abuse, but he eventually kicked it and started living a clean, sober life with uh, a lot of the members from, I believe it was a Sundowners um, AA group. And uh, he got into music. He wanted to follow his father's footsteps and become a producer. So he started uh, with uh, underground raves down in the Hollywood, West Hollywood area. And he had a very uh, popular, popular nights where a lot of people would come make a lot of money. So he started doing promotions at the Dragonfly and uh, the owner at the time, his name is Steve Edelson. Steve Edelson was very impressed with Brett's uh, promotional abilities. So he offered him a percentage of the dragonfly and uh, Brett was going to get out of the rave business because back then the rave business was pretty, pretty dangerous in the sense that you're carrying a lot of money and you could, you could be the victim of crimes at any time. Fights would break out. Police would raid the raves. Uh, but he started to, uh, shy away from that and he started listening to different bands and some of the bands that were performing at the dragonfly and uh, i'm not sure how it came to be but he was very interested in a band called rage against the machine and introduced them to the uh, producers at chrysalis records and uh, they started promoting the band and they became very popular he also uh, helped promote a band by the name of Corn with a K back in the time. Mm -hmm. And so he uh, became uh, an employee of Chrysalis Records as an A&R rep. Well, and Carm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Pat. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. And he continued to do that up up until his, his uh, death. And he was young. He was only 25. Um, Carm, a yeah. couple of questions for you. Do you know what a rave is, Carm? 
Exactly, I don't know, but I, I, I know they sometimes go out into nature in a location and uh, they is, stay, that, is that? That would be incorrect, Karma. A rave is a, a party with crazy music, drugs. Um, it's a type of party, uh, usually at a club in L.A. Uh, have you heard of Rage Against the Machine, Karma? You would like them. Well, of course, I did not hear, but I am pretty sure that raves are also sometimes like outside of clubs, like in a particular locations. That's possible. Maybe in the 50s and 60s when you were partying, Carm. And Korn is a big band as well. But um, Paul, how did you, uh, how did you, Paul's like, what have I gotten myself into? Paul, <laughs> how, did, how did you? Joel, Joel. Yes, Carm. I know about grunge. I know about Nirvana and I know. A Goben who killed himself. Very impressed. Wow. Very, very impressed. Uh, Paul, how did you come to get involved in this uh, from a profiler standpoint? Well, actually, because of Pat, um, because we worked together on the Homicide Bureau and actually going all the way back to uh, early days in our careers in patrol. Um, but um, he asked for me to uh, to get involved, to look at it from the standpoint of um, behavioral analysis. And, um, that's primarily been my part of it is, uh, looking at it from that standpoint. And, um, it's kind of limited in terms of, especially compared to the work that Pat's done on it. Um, but it's kind of a, a, a specialized area. So that's and, been my extent of it. And we'll dig into how you even get going on something that's 30 years old. Um, but just a couple more details, because this is a new story for STS. It's a, it's a really fascinating one. Brett, again, who was 25 when murdered, he was last seen alive on July 30th. Uh, he was leaving a Beverly Hills nightclub, and it wasn't Dragonfly, which he was part owner of. It was another one, I think, called like the 434, um, if I'm right about the numbers. Uh, and he was murdered in his apartment on that same day. Uh, his brother, Cliff, who Pat just told us is no longer with us, which is sad. Uh, he discovered his body the next day, July 31st, 1993, after he failed to show up for work at the Dragonfly uh, nightclub. And the lead investigator on this originally was a guy named uh, Rick Jackson with the LAPD elites robbery uh, homicide unit. By the way, uh, this is an amazing stat. Carmela, how many unsolved murders do you think there are in Los Angeles County alone, Carmela, if you had to guess right now? How many unsolved murders? I know uh, in percentages, maybe I could try. Give me a number, a hard number. Don't try to skedaddle your way out of it, Carm. I would say... I would say I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. 175 or 10,000? More like 10,000. It's 9,000. There are 9,000 unsolved murders in Los Angeles County as of right now. Um, so, Pat, how do, you, how do you get cracking on this? First off, um, JC Nova... Uh, reached out to me. She, she watches STS. Uh, she helped produce this series. She reached out to you uh, from what I understand, you guys were literally neighbors or something, uh, but how do you become involved in this and how do you begin something that happened, you know, 30 years ago in terms of an investigation into it? Okay. Well, uh, when I retired in 2019, I moved down to the South Bay of Los Angeles County and uh, was out walking my dog one day and ran into JC, who was neighbors in the same apartment complex where I lived. And so we started talking and I told her that I retired from the sheriff's department and what I had done. And she asked if I could help her find out some information about it, a good friend of hers that was murdered back in 1993. And uh, she gave me some information about it, Brett's name and stuff. And I contacted a couple of my contacts that I've developed through the years, which led to contacting Rick Jackson, who was the lead homicide detective from robbery homicide, LAPD. And, and then I put him in touch with JC. So after JC spoke with him, she had the idea of doing a podcast to see if we could help gather information to uh, bring some more light to Brett's case to 
uh, revitalize it to get it out into the public again so that people might send in tips or call in tips because a lot of time had transpired. And so uh, I told her, yes, I was interested in doing that. She had already been doing podcasts. Um, she has a podcast called Death by Misadventure, which I listened to several of the episodes and it really intrigued me. She comes at the investigations from a totally different point than I was uh, ever used to. But once, once we gather information, we start uh, looking at all the different social media information, all the press releases, uh, contact uh, the, the police department to try to get some uh, information from them. And uh, that eventually led to a meeting that Paul and myself and JC attended at LAPD's uh, Robbery Homicide Division, where we uh, spoke with the current homicide detectives that are assigned to the unsolved unit. And so it's, it's once we start identifying people like Brett's family, Brett's friends, uh, people that he worked with, and we just basically start from the beginning and just trying to gather all the information we can, which will lead to more information, more people to talk to and, uh, and so on and so on. And so we're, we're just hoping that uh, we have a lot of good information and we're hoping that uh, we could work with LAPD or at least pass information on to them so that they could work on Brett's case and uh, uh, hopefully hopefully get it solved. And I just want to correct uh, one thing that I, I misspoke about. I said that Brett was a music producer and that was inaccurate. He's actually a, a music executive and he would help find talent that they have producers to produce. Um, correction duly noted. Uh, Paul, to you, same question. Uh, again, this is 1993. It's now 2023. From a profiling uh, standpoint, how do you begin to profile this? What kind of information do you need to gather? I can tell you guys both firsthand that, you know, I just did a quick Google search. Um, very little comes up on this, almost nothing. Uh, even the photo of Brett is, uh, you know, a very old photo, um, you know, uh, kind of grainy, black and whitish looking photo. So even the pictures are hard to come by. But, Paul, to you, how, how do you start uh, down this road? It begins with a review of um, the case information, um, understanding the, um, the timing, uh, the location where this occurs, um, and obviously the manner um, in which he was killed. Uh, behavior is something that is dictated by individual personalities. So when you're looking at um, any kind of violent encounter, but especially when you're talking about a homicide, the, um, the injuries that were inflicted can be extremely revealing in terms of um, the inter um, interactions between the offender or offenders and the victim, um, but it can also give you some insights into um, the personalities that are involved and um, possible motivations, uh, whether there is a large amount of anger involved, whether there is um, uh, more than one person involved. Uh, you can have, as in this particular instance, um, uh, an indication of multiple weapons. So you get an idea of whether you're talking about a single individual or you're talking about multiple individuals. In this case, um, there are sharp force injuries um, that were inflicted on Brett. Uh, there are blunt force injuries and um, there are indications that he was confined in a limited area. Um, he was found dead in his own bedroom and there is no indication of ransacking. Um, so we have an individual who is basically being um, restrained in a confined area. And we have two separate sharp force in, um, implements that are being um, utilized. We know that from the autopsy because of the uh, measurements that are provided of the wounds by the pathologist. Um, so in interpreting what happens in the scene, you have an impression of, 
um, a minimum of two people who were involved, possibly three. This occurs in his own apartment um, during the early morning hours of the 30th. Um, he's not found for um, over a day, uh, 24 hours later, uh, by his brother. So at the time that he was confronted, he was wearing his undershirt and boxer shorts. Um, and he is um, in his own apartment, which is secured. So anybody who got in there, there's no indication of forced entry. Um, so at least one of the individuals that's present um, is somebody that is at least familiar uh, to him. And after the murder occurs, the body is covered with a blanket and there's a pillow that's thrown on top of his head. This is behavior that is um, considered a form of, they call it undoing. And what that means basically is that somebody who was involved in this um, didn't want to look at him after he was dead and literally is hiding uh, or covering the site. It's a psychological process of um, making it go away or hiding it. Um, so you have an indication of at least one person who is known to him. You have at least two people who are involved um, in the murder itself. And then you get into the difference between, because we're not talking about one individual anymore, we're talking about two, maybe three, could be more. Um, you have to look at it from the standpoint of who is the dominant individual and what are the motivations that are involved. Brett is a person who um, was known to carry large amounts of cash. Um, it was discovered in um, the, uh, the later investigative uh, um, information that Pat developed that um, he apparently owned a gun. Um, his wallet was missing, um, but there was $5,000 in cash or roughly that in cash that was left. A uh, Rolex watch was left in plain sight on his dresser. Um, and the, we don't know what kind of a gun it was, a handgun. Uh, apparently there was no gun found. So, um, Robbery was not the motivation. Um, they had easy access to money and um, a watch uh, that was certainly valuable. Um, so the motivation is something other than that. Um, and you begin developing based on the way that this occurs, um, an idea of um, the types of individuals that ha would have to be involved, somebody who has at least got some um, some criminal um, history um, and um, possibly some of the reasons um, and uh, the, the fact that nothing is stolen means that there is a personal component. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, an interpersonal relationship um, that's involved. Um, it basically comes down to uh, making decisions about who the types of people are who would be involved in a crime like this, and then um, trying to point information or provide information to the police um, to give them an idea of the directions that they would go, but also to provide information to the public so that they have got some idea of um, anyone who is familiar with Brett and his circumstances who are the individuals that would have come into contact with him and that would potentially have had conflict with him. And hopefully that stimulates information um, that people may call in and help to develop leads. That's really what this is all about. And uh, Carm, uh, I know you're very intrigued by the psychological no, I, aspect of this. I had a question. Uh, I know. It was gonna, not that important. We're going to get there in like one a second, a Carm. question. Didn't, didn't the neighbors hear shouting and they didn't do anything about it? Or? Actually, you're right, man, they did. Um, a neighbor next door to his apartment um, basically heard, um, they heard shouting and um, uh, Pat would have to refresh my memory, something to the effect of um, they're going to kill me or something like that. Um, unfortunately, it lasted a very brief period of time 
And when it got quiet, they decided that somebody was being overly dramatic or um, they didn't do anything about it at the time. They did not call the police, unfortunately. Pat, what, what, been, what was being Pat? What was being uh, yelled that night? And uh, do you all do you, do you? I mean, I'm sure you and Paul are working together. Do you believe? Um, I mean, Paul just said it's at least two individuals, possibly three. Uh, one of them had to have known him. It seems like. Um, but what what were they yelling? Well, Brett was yelling uh, something to the effect of, "Please don't kill me! Don't kill me!" And uh, like he said, a neighbor heard. But for whatever reason, they did not call the police. Now, as far as the, how many people were involved, I, I believe the same as Paul, that there was uh, uh, more than one person involved. And uh, somebody was apparently familiar to Brett. Other information that we had was that when Brett went home that night, uh, early in the morning, that he... Uh, had some type of a date lined up with who and at what time don't know other than Brett had told one of his friends who we had interviewed that uh, he had a, a date set for that night. So it's possible that uh, a, fa a familiar female came over and uh, um, Brett opened the door and then other people, I believe, uh, blitzed him and rushed in and, and uh, uh, detained him and limited his mobility, like Paul had explained, and then did what they did. Mm. Uh, Carm, just so you know, Tali is checking in from uh, Israel, and uh, she's happy to be doing this on uh, Israeli time. We've got Phoenix in the house here, Phoenix, Arizona. We've got uh, Vancouver, and we've got the UK with Julie Fru. Uh, along with our friend Kitty here. So uh, some of STS Nation's regulars are in the house. Angela said, we missed you, Carm. And V just I said, missed you guys too. I really did. Yeah, she's back at it. Um, so but, uh, can I just ask the two of you gentlemen? Uh, Carm, you, you, can, you can even interrupt time. me from 8,000 miles away, Carm. It works whether you're Eight inches away or 8,000 miles away? The interruption still will. Go ahead, Karn. The interruption is very important <laughs> because it, it's, I would like to know your technique. Uh, do, you, uh, do you discuss the case and the, uh, your, your interpretations? And do you have like this dialogue trying to um, see if the other one validates it since you're both seasoned and both have your own idea of what happened? Do you do you do like a lot of brainstorming together? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, I come in it from one direction. Paul comes at it from another direction. And uh, uh, when you get when you get down to the bottom of it, it's it's all pretty much the same opinion as far as how things happened, what had happened, and then we just try to. Uh, continue brainstorming. We talk to other people, get their opinion. Uh, a lot of them don't fit. And uh, some also give you a little bit more to think about. And then once we think of a, maybe this is what happened, then we try to uh, either prove or disprove that that was something that occurred to help us eliminate um, things, things that may have happened and uh, events that may have led to Brett's death. Mm. Um, hey, from Ohio, y'all. Carm's vanilla background al allows her to shine without. <laughs> um, Carm scratching a chair on a ceramic. I'm trying floor. to get rid of it because it ruins the vanilla. Please don't, <laughs> have it. Carmela. I did it. Thank you. <laughs> um, for those who don't know, Rose McGowan is a big actress. Um, big time. And she was dating Brett Cantor back then. And uh, she commented on the way he died that evening. And she, this is a direct quote. What really messed me up, I always thought of how much fear he died with and what terror his body uh, felt. I don't know why it always uh, stuck with me. I know that I have certain powers and I have access to things. Even it doesn't seem like I would have access eventually to police chief or investigators and things like that. I just have a real problem with injustice. I really, really do. It just bothers me 
uh, incredibly. Um, Paul, have you had a chance, or Pat, but I'll start with you, Paul, to uh, interview Rose McGowan. Has she spoken to you um, in any capacity? She might have some information. No, she hasn't spoken with me directly. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to be part of the interviews that uh, um, Pat was doing. Um, I did read um, the book that she wrote, um, and she actually talks about um, uh, Brett and her relationship with him in there. Um, and obviously, um, listen to um, bits of the, the interviews that she did um, with with Pat. Um, as far as the other individuals are concerned, I, um, I like I said, have not been involved in the, the actual interviews, but I've reviewed uh, the statements that they've made in conjunction with um, uh, obviously the um, information from the investigation and the pathology and um, trying to coalesce all of the information together to make determinations, as Pat said, is a, a matter of um, trying to rule in or rule out different possibilities. There are some that can be eliminated um, outright, and there are others that, unfortunately, in a case like this, there, there can be multiple possibilities. Um, he was involved in a very um, wide-ranging um, social group um, with the, between the raves and the different individuals involved with the, uh, the club and with the, um, uh, the individuals that he, uh, was associated with, there could be, um, there could be several different, um, uh, possible motives here. Uh, one of the ones that, uh, the lead investigator talked about was the possibility of, uh, a message killing which is also possible. The idea of sending a message to other people associated um, in one group or another that he was involved with. Um, it, it's, it's difficult there to, um, when there are so many different avenues for somebody to have access to an individual, um, there are then that many more opportunities for there to be uh, some kind of hostility um, it just opens up more possibilities and trying to narrow the scope of those possibilities is really dependent on information coming from people who, um, to know the most about him and about what was going on in his life, in his life at the time. Mm. Uh, Karm, Brenda Lord says, do not let Joel push you around. It's never the other way around. It's always me. I'm always the bully. It's never... I can't wait for this book to come what out. What can I tell you, Joel? What can I tell I you? The book's going to come out. The book is going to reveal all. Uh, Marina, I hope you're doing well. We got That's a, a, that's a real threat. He's writing a book. That is, as um, opposed to a shark threat. You said a, a whale. That's a veiled, 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 veiled. Marina is in uh, the south of Spain. She says, I hope you're doing well. Uh, she uh, had an issue the other night. Hope you're doing well, Marina. Uh, Pat, to you, is it your belief um, from the from what I've heard, which is, you know, just an inkling of this case, it sounds like um, these two or three people got in uh, because he appeared to know someone. So is 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 the does the crux of this case lie with who this woman was that he was meeting? Is that your belief? Well, it, that's a, a strong possibility. One of the things that the LAPD uh, found while they were processing the crime scene was a strand of like a platinum blonde hair. And uh, uh, that may possibly belong to the female that went to Brett's house. Uh, it, it may not. It's just something that was there. And uh, back at the time, they were not able to do any DNA testing on it, but they did do follow up and contact some females or a female that the hair may possibly belong to, and she was ruled out. Um, so that's, that's still something that could probably be tested today because of the way the DNA has advanced. Before, you had to have what's called a, a, a root ball. That's a layman's term for the, the genetic material that's attached to the hair when it's pulled out of the person's skin or hair or head 
whatever. Paul could explain more about that, but um, uh, it, it, we don't know. It could have been a female. It, it might not have been. Uh, that's still a possibility that we're looking into and trying to gather more information to narrow it down. Mm. Uh, by the way, Carm, look at this. Space Coast is someone you know. That is my wife's brother. And he says, he's moderating, Carm. He says, Carm should come raving with me one day. Uh, you and Space and Then Coast. I'll know better. He lives in L.A. He lives yeah, in you L.A. Got, you guys but I have to tell you that um, we are talking in a very civil, rational way. And I'm still trying to figure out where does O.J. get into this picture and the restaurant Mezzaluna come get into this picture. I never could put it together yet. Carm, once again, I uh, I produce, I direct, and you are uh, the co-host. And now you're jumping nine steps ahead of me. Um, so we'll get, we're going to get there, Carm. I promise you, we're going to get okay. there. But first, let's get into the continue to get into the story. So Pat, um, now I'm going to get the hate mail. But Pat, the night this happens, July thirtieth. What are some of the key details about this night? Kind of walk us through. Um, he owned part of Dragonfly, which was a nightclub. But that evening, he went to a different club. I want to say it was called the 434, unless I have the numbers wrong. So tell us, um, you know, what were his movements that final night and some of the key details, if you could. From, from, what, I, uh, from what I know, he was at a, another nightclub and uh, – uh, eventually went to some restaurants and he was with one of his friends and he apparently Brett apparently saw someone that he had some type of a conflict with and told his friend, Hey, you know what? Let's get out of here. I don't want to stick around anymore. Uh, I don't want to have any problems. And so from there they left and he went home. His, uh, I believe his friend dropped him off or, I, I don't remember exactly, uh, but he, the friend talked to Brett around uh, um, early in the morning and uh, just basically just saying, see you later, t talk to you later or whatever. And uh, and then that was it. That was the last thing that anybody had seen or heard of Brett until uh, almost, um, almost 24 hours later. Uh, Brett was supposed to go to the Dragonfly, and he never showed up. And uh, so Cliff, his brother, was worried about Brett and didn't know what had happened, why he wasn't there. So he went to Brett's apartment, and that's when he uh, discovered Brett. And and then, of course, summons the police department, who went out there to. Uh, but uh, but they they think they think he left this uh, four three four and went home already at 1 a.m., which I consider very early in the night for those yeah. who, yes. who are partying, yeah. right? Yes. So right? Yes. He went home relatively early. Relatively early. And and, uh, and again, he was, you know, he reportedly was going to meet some woman. But um, Paul, to you from Frankie Figs, who's a friend of the show, um, why do you think he knew the person when he could have simply answered the door uh, to anyone. I mean, that is a good point. You know, um, he, you know, he may have just been uh, a welcoming person, but are there, are there specific indications? Is, is it that pillow that the person didn't want to see him that gives you that inkling of thought that they did know them? It's that's part of it. Um, he was not known to entertain people at his apartment. The only people typically who would come there were women that he invited that um, he was a bit of a carouser from what I understand. Um, and he entertained women there, but he didn't have social gatherings there. It was not usual for people to visit him there. Um, the state of dress that he was in at the time that he was killed um, suggests that um, if he was going to the door to answer it, it was going to be to somebody that he was familiar with and he didn't even bother to put on a robe. Um, the change uh, may have occurred or some change may have occurred in his attire after this person came in, but it's not really likely um, that if, if uh, there were three people at the door that he would have answered it that way unless he was actually only expecting one and it then turned out, or somebody 
who was admitted then went back and let somebody else in. Um, but that in combination with the fact that um, the body was covered the way that it was afterward um, strongly suggests that you got at least one person there who was known to him. And Pat, I have uh, every week, uh, I do a regular show with a guy named uh, Phil Waters, Detective Phil Waters, formerly with the Houston PD. Uh, he investigated over 400 homicides, and he always says to me, Joel, people kill over sex, drugs, or money. Um, what do you think the motive was here? Do you, do you Have you been able to kind of zero in on that a little bit better? Well, that, that's that's a little difficult in the sense that being what uh, Brett was involved in, the Hollywood lifestyle, the Hollywood crowd, the music industry, uh, at that particular time and even before and even still to this day, there's always a lot of uh, um, violence in the music industry. They're dealing with large amounts of money. They're dealing with, with uh, egos, if you will. They're dealing with um, gang issues nowadays, you know, the East Coast, West Coast type of thing, like several of the uh, shootings have been over. Uh, it's just a hodgepodge of, of nefarious activity, if you will. And and uh, the motive, it could be that um, I think that Brett maybe knew about something that he uh, did not like. It could be drugs. It could be guns. Because we have information that there was drugs and guns being run through the dragonfly and that uh, uh, Brett was the type of person that wanted to clean up the, the clean up the club, if you will, because he wasn't into drugs any longer. He was clean and sober for a long time. He didn't like uh, problems at the club and uh, he would he would um, kick people out. Steve Edelson would also uh, 86 people out of the club, but there was something going on. I believe that he was interfering with, and uh, he was, he was, uh, he was dealt with. I think that the people who went over to Brett's house tried to maybe um, um, get his cooperation to allow stuff to happen or convince him not to say anything about things that he might have been aware of. Uh, it, it's it's really hard to say exactly what it was, but I do not believe it was anything like uh, a, a, a lover, a, a, a lover's triangle, uh, a, a jilted uh, girlfriend, or anything like that. I think it had to be with the the business the business itself. There was other nightclubs where there was problems. There was a nightclub where one of the bouncers had been involved in a shooting and shot a couple of people at the nightclub. Uh, the, he was arrested and uh, prosecuted and was acquitted. The jury determined that it was self-defense. And he had a very shady, shady background as well. And uh, there was just a lot of criminal activity going on behind the scenes a lot of drugs um also in uh, the hollywood west hollywood area back then and even today probably uh, i can't say 100 percent today but uh, a, a lot of the business is run by uh organized crime and if you're going to go and open up a business you might wind up getting approached to have to pay taxes and in this, and in the dragonflies particular um uh, instance, uh, one of our uh, people that we talked to who worked at the Dragonfly was approached by some uh, Hispanic gang members that uh, he believed were going to try to tax them. And what that means is, is that you pay them part of your profits uh, and they protect your business. And if you don't, then you're going to have problems with, with doing your day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, back then, um, um, a lot of the businesses that were opened up had to have the uh, 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 silenced approval, if you will, of organized crime. Uh, the Mexican mafia controlled a lot of the narcotics that were being sold to the organized crime in those areas. And there was drugs galore in a, a lot of those nightclubs. And 
And I, I think it just didn't sit well with, with Brett. And uh, for whatever reason, whether he was interfering, whether he was, uh, he was going to uh, tell uh, the authorities or, or he was trying to clean it up. I, I, I truly think that that is more of uh, a, a potential motive than, than, uh, than anything else. Uh, not even uh, competition, even though he had one of the most uh, lucrative nights at the Dragonfly that he produced um, or promoted. I'm sorry. Uh, there was other promoters that he had conflicts with and uh, uh, could one of these other promoters got some people together to uh, take, take bread out. Well, I mean, you know, anything's possible, but I, I don't really lean that way, but that's my opinion. Yeah, and there there's so many uh, roads to go down. Carm, coming to you in one sec. Ashley says Carm is the coolest. Love love her. She knew about Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. I'm impressed. Follow but Carm. Don't get too happy. My favorite comment. Who is Carm? Uh, but Meat Duck is new to the show, so welcome, Meat Duck. Carm, your question. No, I was thinking it sounds a little to me as if uh, his problem was that he cleaned up and he wasn't into drugs. And he became like a born again, no drugs in my uh, in my club type of a person, and and so they were upset that he was this, uh, you know, this um, pure person who doesn't want drugs. In 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 other words, he was he was punished for being clean. Maybe. Um, it's, it's a matter of being um, uh, being in the way, it being in somebody's yeah, way. Yeah, Eliminating yeah, him was, made yeah. made it possible he had for this missionary zeal of 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 not doing it, uh, of going uh, in a different direction rather than you know paying off the the gangs and so forth. He tried to fight that. Maybe he was. Young enough, 25 year old, he could still believe that he can do it. Yeah. Um, I am not T Payne, who just received uh, an STS magnet and proudly displayed it uh, in a photo on Twitter. Thank you, I am not T Payne. Um, are there any suspects, Paul, in this case? I know you know you guys are still working it along with LAPD, I guess, and their cold case unit. Uh, does law enforcement have any ideas on who may be involved? Is there anyone that you are quietly zeroing in on, or is it really kind of like a tabula rasa at this point, just a blank slate, Paul? I think there are, are different possibilities. Unfortunately, the, um, the areas that uh, the LAPD is focused on so far are um, individuals that they were able to either get information about, or they had um, evidence that was developed. Um, and, there was a blood stain that was found in uh, the house, and ultimately, um, it was determined that this belonged to an individual who um, was um, basically doing a service for Brett in, in terms of cleaning his apartment, and accidentally cut himself. And there's just this one aberrant stain. It's not in the same area where the body is, um, and. This is a person who readily admitted that they were at the apartment, that they were cleaning, and um, this is what happened. And there's no real um, reason to suspect any other involvement or association. Um, it, it just unfortunately takes a very long time sometimes to get the information that's necessary to provide um, fruitful leads, really. Um, and what they had at the time all uh, there was a the talk about an individual who um, there was a conflict with at the club um, and suddenly this person disappeared um, I believe it was the day before uh, uh, Brett was discovered dead um, which would have corresponded to the time when the killing occurred if I understand correctly um, that person has never been located uh, it's believed that he is out of the country at this point. Um, so how far they have gone with it, uh, to the best of our understanding, what leads they had at the time have been exhausted. 
there's been nothing else that has um, been sufficient to um, uh, really generate um, enough information for somebody to be determined as a suspect at this point or a prime suspect. There are several people who are involved um, with him and with the club. Um, and Pat can talk more about some of the, um, uh, the involvement of um, different individuals who were involved in Hollywood. One um, individual was um, a, um, I, I guess, a, a door person at one time and was also involved with people who were involved or who were doing uh, follow home robberies. Um, that is still a possibility. There is one individual that Pat can talk about who was arrested and um, ended up in prison for a separate murder, which um, also was a stabbing. Yeah. Um, Pat has more information about the individual himself. Um, that is a possibility. Um, again, we come down to timelines and um, availability. This is a person who may have... Um, been involved, but this is also a person who was committing robberies. And if he had the opportunity to be in a place where there was a Rolex watch that was sitting out and uh, very um, uh, obvious, not something that somebody is going to overlook, and money that was um, available, if I believe it was in a dresser drawer, there was no ransacking. This is the kind of person who would have been looking for things to steal. So that doesn't really seem like it pans out, but probably um, with more information could be either more definitively excluded or possibly included. Mm. Alec Koch checking in from uh, South Africa. We are a global show here. Um, Pat, you can uh, pick up on where Paul just left off, but uh, also I think you are concerned or had some questions um, about the description uh, revolving around the last time Brett Cantor was seen alive. And that still raises questions. Can you speak to that? Well, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the description, what are you referring um, to? He seemed nervous. Yeah, the way he, I oh, guess oh, he was oh. acting the last time he was seen alive. Yeah, still still raising some questions. You talked about it a little bit, but right. um, anything further on that? Well, the, there, there's a, a, a lot of uh, information, and uh, a lot of it's going to be revealed on uh the podcast dragonfly podcast the murder of uh brett Cantor, which is going to be coming out in uh in a next week uh july 18th will be the premiere of the podcast and it's going to be on all of the different podcast platforms streaming platforms uh so i you know i really want people to listen to get the whole gist of it and so um uh i don't want to spoil the 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 information if you will yeah. uh i want people to listen because we're just kind of touching the top of the iceberg right now and we're not really going into a lot of the detail or else we would be on your podcast for several hours and uh um which i mean i don't mind but you know i'm sure your listeners don't want to listen to me for another couple of hours uh but there were people that that uh, are I would say uh, persons of interest and uh, they're, they'll be revealed during the um, different episodes on the podcast also. And is, uh, is Rose McGowan? She's on the podcast as well. Is that right? And did you interview her? Uh, JC interviewed Rose and uh, uh, she, she gave a, a lot of good information, a lot of good detail. Uh, one of the things that, that Rose was extremely instrumental for was to have, Brett's case reopened in 2006 and uh, um, there was a, a period where LAPD's robbery homicide division transferred from Parker Center downtown LA to another building downtown and uh, uh, so there was some stuff they got mixed up during the, the transfer which uh, Rose was was very helpful because she had a connection with the chief of police at the time. And, you know, when the chief of police tells you to do something, uh, you do. And uh, apparently uh, Rick Jackson, the lead detective 
from the uh, original time in 93 was contacted by the chief of police and asked about the case. And uh, they started looking into it again based on some information that Rose was able to provide. And that also will be on the the podcast. And uh, Carm had brought this up earlier. Nightwood says, uh, why did OJ's defense team want files on uh, Brett Cantor's murder? There is an OJ intersection here, more than one, really. Uh, I don't know who wants to take this, Pat or Paul. Uh, Pat, you want to start there? Yeah, I can speak to that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, not a hundred percent positive how this came to be, but from what I understand, somebody may have approached the dream team, OJ's dream team and said, Hey, you know what? There was a guy killed a year before uh, Ron and Nicole were killed. And, uh, it seems like it might've been similar because, uh, his name was Brett Cantor, and he had his uh, throat slit, and they did a Colombian necktie on him. And uh, um, so if you re- remember from the uh, testimony during the O.J. Simpson case, the defense tried to allude to the fact that um, uh, uh, Ron and Nicole were killed by Colombian drug dealers because they gave him a Colombian necktie. And that that is absolutely not the case that never happened to brett uh there was no connection that we could find or that lapd could find between brett and um ron and nicole and uh uh what it was is that they they were throwing out a red herring to try to point the guilt of oj somewhere else and they were looking for any murders that had happened during that time frame that would be similar to Ron and Nicole's murders. And so uh, the judge, Judge Ito, uh, wanted to uh, examine the uh, information and, and had Rick Jackson go into court. And uh, the bottom line was the Judge Ito determined that there's no connection and that they could not uh, bring up Brett Cantor's case during the uh, prosecution of oj simpson judge ito let everything else in the world happen but not that uh go, go, yeah. <laughs> go ahead yeah. Carm. Uh, there is this restaurant miss luna uh, i have to say that i was following uh, oj simpson totally absorbed in it i was you know you could only watch it on tv there were no uh, no other media that you could watch it on, but I watched, and there was there was this restaurant where uh, um, what Ron is Gold, the Ron the, Goldman, Ron, Ron, Goldman. Goldman. Yeah. Ron Goldman worked, and yeah. somehow either he knew Cantor or somehow there was another association. Well, Carm, I'm glad you brought that up because I took notes on this. So, uh, Paul Brett Cantor had apparently uh, pushed underground music. Uh, in his nightclub where Ron Goldman apparently once worked. I don't know if it was hit, the Dragonfire, another one. And uh, Nicole Brown Simpson would go there often. By the way, uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were murdered June 12th of 94. Brett's happened July 30th of 93. So almost uh, about 11 months later, uh, Ron and Nicole are murdered. Um, this question from V. Louise Arthur, uh, Paul. What connections did OJ have with the victim? If any, I read that the killings were eerily similar to Nicole and Ron. Um, I mean, Pat basically just said that, uh, you know, there was no Colombian necktie, uh, that he doesn't think it was any kind of strong connection. Do you concur with all that? Yeah, I do. Um, there was um, some association with uh, with Brett, and um, uh, he, he was familiar with, um, I, I think, uh, Simpson through, um, uh, somebody else that was involved in the music industry. It was a, um, several years prior and a very fleeting, um, association, uh, as far as Ron Goldman and, um, uh, Nicole, it, it was, there was so much that was happening in the LA area and they were part of 
an elite group of people who um, frequented clubs of this sort. So um, the fact that there is there happens to be a little bit of overlay or, or um, uh, coincidental, um, uh, I don't even want to say interaction, just kind of um, passing through, um, that's, that's not really sufficient to indicate that there is actually a relationship or any knowledge between these individuals and certainly not an association that would have carried from one murder to the others. Um, right. There is really absolutely no similarity in terms of the, um, the injuries that were sustained by Brett and what was suffered by, um, by Nicole and Ron. And Paul, this is a, right in your wheelhouse. Do you believe the people who went to his place that night had the original intent to murder, or do you think this was a situation where they wanted to scare him and it quickly got out of hand? That's really a good question. And um, because you have indications of asphyxia is in addition to the sharp force injuries from two separate knives, as I mentioned, um, it's one of those situations where it may have been the type of thing that started off as a, um, a form of intimidation and then escalated because of either a lack of cooperation on Brett's part um, or there, he really did not have much of an opportunity to resist. Um, whether they expected or wanted him to do something or stop something that was interfering with what they or they wanted um, is really kind of up in the air still. Um, it's very possible that the murder was not the original intention, but um, they were certainly willing to go there and it didn't take long for it to, to get to that point. Uh, Pat Elf, who's a friend of the show. Carm, go ahead, Carm. Let my dear mother. Uh, someone said here. <laughs> they always yell at him that he's not nice to me. He's very nice to me. Smashley says, Carm, don't let Joel cut you off. Go ahead, Carm. Usually they say don't let. And I usually cut Joel off. But I don't notice that somehow they forgive me. But it, it's kind of. I mean, I don't understand. How how much do does the LA uh, police know about the gangs and 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 the, is it in do they infiltrate these gangs? Do they know who who is running them and what is the hierarchy? Because you know, for, to somebody who doesn't know anything but loves to give opinions, I think that it is gang related. Mm. Harm, putting it out there, gang related, and uh, you think it's a like a Mexican drug gang hit. Uh, Pat, um, what kind of intelligence does the LAPD and LA County Sheriff's Office have in terms of the uh, highest ranks of the uh, Mexican, you know, drug gangs? Well, as far as uh, LAPD, I cannot speak to them uh, exactly, but I do know that our department, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and the Los Angeles Police Department. They work hand in hand. They both have uh, units that deal with organized crime, prison gangs, and uh, uh, different different uh, stuff like that. And they're continue, they're, they continually update each other as far as what's going on. They do have task forces, narcotic task forces that they uh, work in conjunction with DEA and FBI. And back then, we spoke to several people who were extremely knowledgeable with the gang activity that was going on, which ranged from uh, street gang members all the way up to uh, organized crime, Mexican mafia, uh, Russian mafia, um, uh, different, different uh, uh, entities that were very active back in the uh, early 90s. And there's several... Uh, murders that have happened down there that were behind the drug activity, behind the organized crime activity. And uh, some of that is also addressed during the podcast that we're doing. And uh, uh, there was a lot of involvement. And so um, you could be right, Carm. I have a question. 
you see, I it was like off for a few weeks, so I'm kind of raring to go, but I don't understand exactly why did Michael, why was Michael Nick uh, mentioned in this context? Well, you'll have to listen to the podcast to find that out. I certainly shall. <laughs> elf. I am a time millionaire. Elf, elf with a, a time millionaire. I like that, Carm. Uh, elf with the super sticker here. Uh, Paul, to you. Was there any DNA evidence left at the scene? Um, how was this crime scene process? Keep in mind, this was a different time 30 years ago. It's weird, though. 1993, when I think about it, and I'm 53, seems like yesterday, but it was 30 years ago. But, uh, Paul, how uh, how was the scene processed? Excuse me. Um, uh, one second before you get into that, Paul. Uh, let me just clarify something. Uh, uh, the way the way the, uh, the the cases work. So originally, when LAPD got the information about a, a possible murder, Hollywood LAPD homicide rolled out to the scene, and those detectives were the ones who were responsible with gathering the evidence, documenting the evidence, and everything else. It wasn't until a day or two later that. Uh, the case was handed off from LAPD Hollywood division to the uh, elite homicide team at robbery homicide, which handles a lot of the high profile murder cases. So the, uh, uh, the processing was done by one uh, unit at LAPD and then turned over to Rick Jackson uh, a couple of days later. So, you could go ahead after that, Paul. Yeah. Okay. Um, the um, the original processing um, involves um, obviously going through the entire um, location looking for evidence. It starts in the immediate area of the body and then it expands from there. And it's a very long, laborious process. And Pat mentioned the hair that was found um, and um, I mentioned the blood stain that was found, which was in the living room, not in the bedroom. Um, the um, extent of processing to that hair, I couldn't tell you. Um, I, I know for a fact that somebody was eliminated um, based on comparison. I don't know if that was simply characteristics of the hair itself or um, if there was DNA that was taken um, the epithelial cells, which are the skin cells that are accumulated around the follicle, are what are used for DNA. Um, the hair shaft itself can produce a certain kind of DNA that provides information regarding to um, the maternal uh, lineage, um, but it doesn't um, include the entire uh, DNA um, line the same way that skin cells or blood would. Um, they were um, as thorough as um, um, as anybody else would have been. It's not like they were um, the the people in West Hollywood were doing or in Hollywood Division were doing um, a substandard job by comparison to what robbery homicide would do. Um, their process is a little bit different than what we had in the sheriff's department or still have in the sheriff's department. Um, we uh, sheriff's homicide is a uh, headquarters unit. And um, if there is a murder, it doesn't make any difference what kind of a murder is when your time is up, when you're in the rotation, the next, um, the next case that comes in goes to you. So it doesn't matter if it's uh, a drug case, if it's a gang case, if it's a child abuse case, if it's a domestic uh, gang, whatever, it doesn't make any difference. It goes to the next person in line. Um, that's kind of the way that their uh, the LAPD's division homicide um, units work. Um, but as far as um, the hierarchy is concerned, the division um, has got homicide investigators. Um, and if it's a general homicide, they are the ones who will take it. But um, gang murders were typically worked by their gang investigators. Child abuse murders were, um, or child murders were handled by their child um, 
abuse investigators. So they have a lot more people working specialized um, types of murders um, than the sheriff's department was. Um, in some ways, that's a bit of an advantage, but as far as the investigative process is concerned, um, you get to be very good at working the entire range of murders when you get to um, work whatever comes in just by virtue of the fact that um, uh, there's a wide range um, or types of murders that happen. And when you get to work all of them, you get to be very good at looking at the individual um, uh, indicators um, that help to distinguish between the types. As far as the processing is concerned, though, the scene is processed the same in any kind of a murder by all of these people. So there would not have been anything that was substandard in what was done before robbery homicide got involved. And um, we don't have access to all of the evidence that was, um, that was obtained, but um, the types of things that normally would have been um, looked at um, were um, examined in this case, uh, things like fingernails and, and you know, things like that. Uh, looking for offender DNA, um, none of that provided any information. Um, so to answer the question, it was processed. There was um, that one blood stain and that hair that provided um, sources of potential DNA. But so far, um, one person has been eliminated just based on the association when they interviewed that person. Um, and the person that was known to have blonde hair was eliminated, but nothing else has come of it. Carm, I saw if, you. If you color your if you color your hair, does that change anything? You know, Actually, it um, it changes the outward appearance. Um, they can tell obviously whether it has been bleached or whether it's a natural blonde hair. Um, as far as the structure is concerned. Um, there's not really going to be a lot of difference between, there may be some differences um, between different ethnic groups. Um, and even if it's been bleached, you would be able to tell um, that there is a certain um, uh, characteristic of the hair that might give you an indication of where it came from. Um, but unless you've got DNA that comes from the follicle, you probably won't even be able to tell if it's coming from a male or female. You can usually tell the difference between an eyelash um, and um, facial hair, um, pubic hair, uh, different types of um, you know uh, characteristics that come from head hair. Um, but if, if it's bleached or if it's treated in one way or another, they're gonna be able to make that determination. They may not be able to be to tell what the original hair color was, like if it was red, auburn, or brown, uh, or black, as opposed to blonde. Um, but they'll be able to make some some determinations. Mm. Uh, Pat, to you, uh, Mo Dean uh, likes to come in and uh, give us all a hard time. I think the OJ story uh, overshadowed this story, uh, unless OJ did this too. Obviously, at this point, you don't think there's a real connection. But to his point, um, I mean, that was the biggest, you know, trial of the century. Uh, do you believe that L.A. put too many resources onto O.J. at that time and maybe uh, a little less than there should have been in terms of, uh, you know, in investigative resources on this case once O.J. happened? Well, you have to remember that the uh, Ron and Cole were murdered almost a year after Brett, so... LAPD had the, uh, the whole, a whole year to investigate the case and do whatever they had to do. How much resources were put to it? I don't know. I don't know if it was one team, two teams. I do know that they had a ton of um, clues that came in uh, and they interviewed a whole bunch of people and they, they, they did not come. They, they did not solve it, and uh, uh, and so when the O.J. Simpson prosecution came up, they already had uh, uh, LAPD already had 
uh, a lot of time to try to uh, solve Brett's case. So uh, to have the OJ case overshadow Brett's case, um, I would say not initially. And of course, when it happened, it overshadowed probably every single murder case that uh, LAPD was investigating because they did put an enormous amount of uh, uh, work into the uh, o- into the OJ case with with uh, several um, homicide detectives uh, and uh, detectives from other uh, specialized units as well, and uh, um, and we were fortunate to have the opportunity to interview the uh, lead ro- robbery homicide detective Tom Lang, uh, who I'm sure you recognize the name. He worked on the OJ case and. He went to all the court hearings and everything, and and uh, uh, he he has a lot of great insight to what happened on the Ron and Nicole murder and uh, Brett Cantor's murder, and that too is going to be included in one of the episodes of the Dragonfly podcast. I'm gonna definitely check it out. Uh, Tom Lang, Carm, you don't remember the name, but you know what he looks like. He's kind of horseshoe, bald head, taller guy. Um, Northern oh, Ireland. Uh, Carmen Joel, will the book be available on Amazon Audible or postage to Ireland for less than my monthly mortgage? Uh, if it is not, which it will be, uh, Northern Ireland Income Poop, I will personally send you a copy uh, with Carm's fingerprint on it uh, all the way to Ireland. Uh, was a dragonfly in Hollywood? The answer to that is yes, Pat, right? That's the question yes. here. Um, yes. So, and, we're, and we're, 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 as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the Dragonfly is open again uh, mm. and has been opened uh, uh, not a long period of time, but it's open again. And uh, from what I understand, uh, it's a, a nice place to go. I oh, have to check it out when I'm in uh, in L.A., although it's uh, might make harm nervous. I don't know. It's, uh, it's a scary place. Uh, we're going to wrap it up in just a second. Uh, Rose McGowan, here's a, qu- a quote from her on Brett Cantor. Brett was just this kind of a rainbow of a person. Brett was just really magnetic and he had these incredible blue eyes and he was just funny. He was just so brash, but a really not, but really not in an obnoxious way. Uh, Stephen Tracy weighing in, Paul here. The people that killed him are known as disposal team. I guess that's a drug term, Paul, um, that they would go in to eliminate him. Is that something that you've concluded um, or no? No. Um, oh, this. And I don't know who Stephen Tracy is, but then he comes here and says they blame it on the Hispanic gangs and the mob, but it has all the earmarks of an intelligence style hit, a hit from the company. Does, does any of this resonate with you? Well, I think when he sees company, is he referring to uh, the CIA? If so, uh, I, I think that's far fetched. Yeah, uh, Paul. As far as the uh, as far as the intelligence part of it, or the um, um, the style of hit, it's not necessarily um, something that you would say is associated with um, Hispanic gangs or black gangs or um, the uh, the mafia. It is the type of thing that would be consistent with an elimination. Um, which basically has to do with um, removing a um, an obstacle to something that somebody intends, um, or um, it's possible that it could be a vendetta, um, but it really seems to me like um, it is more of an elimination, as um, as they put it. Um, that's um, that's kind of the sense that I get. But as I mentioned, there are a lot of different avenues with this. And there's even um, an indication that there was foreknowledge um, that before this actually occurred, someone was aware and had made mention of the fact that there was a danger to him. And um, there's an indication that information came out about the death before the body had even been discovered. So those are other issues that are, are going to be discussed in the uh, in the episodes. And, and Modine adds, uh, would a hit job produce so many stab wounds? Seems like the multiple stabbings make it more personal 
uh, then a hit job again, followed by this gentleman, Stephen Tracy, who I've never seen on here before, but he is welcome to join. Uh, the reason that there were so many stab wounds is so that it would look like a crime of passion. But uh, if multiple stab wounds are usually there to make sure the person dies and it's also to make it look personal. Uh, any comments here, Paul? Well, in this particular instance, you've got um, you've got multiple stab wounds. Uh, the vast majority of them are superficial. Um, there are um, uh, two wounds that are um, potentially fatal, and then you also have um, uh, manual asphyxiation. Uh, in terms of the order, it's it's difficult to tell. Um, the uh, the asphyxiation was anti-mortem. Um, so more than likely there was an attempt first or an attempt at strangulation contemporary uh, to part of the stabbing. Um, the order is difficult to say, but in terms of um, uh, whether or not um, one person started and the other person joined, that it seems more like he was actually confronted by at least two individuals and both were actively involved in restraining him and then ultimately in his death. Um, the, the superficial stab wounds may have been, um, they may have been initially for the purpose of torment. Um, uh, it could be for torture to convince him of something or, um, um, literally for the, for the purpose of punishing him. We, again, the possibilities um, uh, are kind of far ranging here, but um, it speaks to somebody who had, as opposed to a personal grudge, had um, uh, a reason basically to remove an obstacle. It's, it's really, um, that's not a foregone conclusion, but that's, that's kind of the, the inclination that I have at this point. And uh, I'm intrigued by Stephen Tracy. He said, this is what I meant. It seems like a company hit a hit from the CIA and there's speculation that the DEA or somebody in the government, some officials were involved with the drugs. Uh, you just heard Pat Tapia say that uh, he's, uh, sort of disinclined to believe that. Uh, Pat, to you, uh, final question, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, what is uh, next in the case? I understand the Cold Case Foundation has joined. What does that mean? And some people are asking, is this an active investigation? Well, the Cold Case Foundation is uh, consists of uh, retired law enforcement officers from uh, DEA, FBI, uh, and other uh, police municipalities. And what they do is they offer their services to other agencies to assist them in looking into the circumstances surrounding murders that they have. And in this case, Ronnie uh, Cantor asked if the Cold Case Foundation can assist in any way. So as far as uh, uh, them looking into, the, uh, into Brett's case, they would be directly in contact with LAPD and uh, uh, what they discuss or what uh, activities they do together. Uh, we are not privy to that information because they're not working for us as far as the, the ones who are doing the podcast. Um, uh, we are merely doing the podcast to try to, uh, to try to get people who know what happened back then and know who Brett was and, and were afraid to talk back then. A lot of times when, uh, when a lot of time transpires, people who were afraid back when this occurred don't necessarily want to say anything. It's not like they volunteer information to the police, but if the police ask them the questions, they'll answer them. But that's about it. They don't want to be involved. And a lot of times when you have a, a big span of time, they're more likely to talk. And that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping that people will listen to the podcast that's coming out July 18th. And that if they know anything that happened or any information that we could use to pass on to LAPD so they could do the investigation or to do the follow-up or whatever, that's what we are 
um, uh, hoping to do. We're trying to bring light to Brett's case and uh, uh, hopefully bring his family some closure by uh, um, solving it. That's what we want to do. Well said. And Pat, right on cue, Carmela, who whenever we are wrapping a show, she continues real quick. Uh, I am not T-Pain. I just want it to last longer. She says, everyone yell at Joel immediately. T-Pain says that. And no, uh, Carm, no, no, don't. Carm, he, Carm, he me, if you yell at Carm, Michael Couture says, you guys should cover Tupac's murder. It's technically unsolved. Do you know who he is, Carm? Why do I know that Tupac? Why? I'm thinking why I don't remember She's that. A very famous rap artist, Carmela. Yeah, She's I heard it. Biggie, name. East Coast, West Coast, Carm. Um, no, ma, I have a question. Yeah, go for it, Carm. We're wrapping uh, up. So I the, 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 the 9,000 unresolved cases. 8,000. You said nine before. I said eight. You increased it to nine. It's 8,000. Okay. There is inflation today. Carm, I would uh, I'm a journalist, Carm. I would never okay. make that mistake. The eight thousand cases, uh, how far back do they go? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is with with the new technologies, uh, do the unresolved case numbers decrease or they still hold steady and uh, there is no change? Well, as far as how far back the unsolved murders go, well, I don't think they've solved the Black Dahlia murder yet. And uh, also there was uh, murders that occurred in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s that have that were never solved. And believe it or not, these cases are on shelves at the different law enforcement agencies because there's no statute of limitation on murder. So... Uh, if, if it takes 50 years, 100 years, um, you know, they might not be able to prosecute anybody, but they might be able to solve it. So mm -hmm. there's no telling how far back they go. Uh, and, Viva then, and, as far as, and as far as uh, the, the number of unsolved cases, is it decreasing now because of the new technologies? Mm. I, it's kind of hard to tell. That's yeah, actually a great question, Carm. I'm going to follow that up. So we've done a few shows. Uh, there's actually a uh, current case right now of an accused Boston serial rapist, and they use this investigative genetic genealogy. They did that in the Brian Koberger case. Uh, Paul, is that something that can be utilized here with a little bit of DNA and go into some of those databases and try to track it down? We had Barbara Ray Venter on. She solved, helped solve the Golden State Killer case that way. She's sort of the, the godmother of IgG. But is that something that's being looked at, Pat or Paul? It's something that could potentially be looked at. It depends on um, what kind of evidence um, they can develop uh, with what was taken from the scene at the time. We don't have a thorough list of, uh, of that evidence. Um, but at this point, um, processing um, DNA can come from much smaller samples than what used to happen uh, or what used to be required. Um, in 93, um, they had advanced to the point of, um, uh, I think, PCR technology. I don't think that it's necessarily, um, uh, it's not like when they first came out with, with uh, DNA and you had to have very large samples. They actually now can um, process things and get um, skin cells. We all shed skin cells at a prodigious rate all the time. Um, there may be the opportunity to test um, samples of, of items that were taken from the scene in order to um, uh, make a determination as to whether or not there's DNA present. And then the use of the genealogy um, DNA that you're talking about could be of benefit. Um, the further we go, um, the the uh, the more advanced our technology becomes, and um, the wider the possibilities um, open up for us. So as things progress, the possibility um, is always increasing in terms of the hope that we'll be able to solve more and more of these cases. Mm. 
Uh, Miss Demeanor says Carm looks spectacular, which I have to agree with, followed by Catherine Regier, our friend in Hawaii. Thank you, thank you. Now you says, know good I question, like Carm. Your uh, Carm, you notice no one ever says, Joel, you look great in your mint green shirt, or Joel, you prepared well. It's always, the accolades always go to Carm, always. I was up. And you should, you should accept two in the morning. I was up till two in the morning, working on the book, which is about you, working on the podcast, which is about you. Uh, the accolades go oh to you. Oh, my God. Everything is about me. Um, I want to thank hey, these two hey, gentlemen. Man. Go ahead, Joel. Pat. Yes, sir. Uh, that's a nice, That's a nice shirt. Uh, but I, I also want to say something since you brought up the Tupac yeah. uh, uh, murder. You know, there's a lot of investigation that's gone into that. And uh, I happen to have been friends with a detective by the name of Tim Brennan. And Tim Brennan used to work for Compton Police Department. And he used to chase these kids when they were little kids doing their little uh, crimes and stuff. And uh, uh Unfortunately, he's passed away from cancer, but before he did, he wrote a book um, uh, with another uh, friend, last name of Lad, on the Tupac uh, murders. And he was probably one of the most instrumental detectives that gave information to Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, LAPD and other ones, because he knew he knew these people inside and out. So. Uh, uh, I just wanted to throw it out there. And he, uh, he was a, it was a great loss when he uh, passed away. Sorry to hear that. Um, Julie Fru in the UK, Joel, this is about Carm only accept this as your mummy says, um, mummy, the UK version. I want to thank these two gentlemen. The podcast is called Dragonfly Brett Cantor murder mystery. It is co-produced with case file presents and it premieres, July 18th, 2023, next week, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, Pat Tapia, as you just heard, he is a very knowledgeable uh, law enforcement investigator, 38 years uh, on the L.A. County uh, Sheriff's Department, working uh, the Homicide Bulldogs, one of the most recognized law enforcement uh, insignias in the nation. Carm, if I saw Pat Tappy on the street and someone said, what do you, you and I do this, Carm, we look at people, we people watch, we say, what do you think he does? If I saw Pat Tappy, you know what I would say? Homicide detective. Straight out of central <laughs> casting. He looks just like a homicide detective. Pat, your final thoughts. My final thoughts are that uh, the, the whole point is to try to bring light to Brett's murder and to gather information that could help solve it. And, uh, and, and hope we're successful. Awesome. Uh, Paul and I also, want to thank you. I also want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to come on your show and talk about it. Th thank you, Pat. And thanks for being here. We're going to get you on to uh, cover other cases along with Paul uh, using your expertise. Uh, by the way, um, Pat, when you're uh, bored later tonight and Paul, I want you guys to do a little homework and check out a case out of Philadelphia about Ellen Greenberg. We've been on this like uh, white on rice, as they say. She was stabbed 20 times, 10 to the front, 10 to the back. Two an independent autopsy shows two of the stab wounds came after her heart stopped beating. Philadelphia police ruled it a homicide. 12 hours later, they ruled it undetermined. Three months later, they ruled it a suicide. Um, she was engaged at the time, and I'd love for you guys to look at it. A lot of corruption in Philly. We'll get you on about it. Uh, Wildlight Art says, Carm is climbing the show business ladder. It's never too late. She turns 84 in two weeks, August 7th, not two weeks, three or four weeks, August 7th, Carm's birthday. Uh, Paul Delhauer is a consultant and crime scene reconstruction expert. He's a profiler. He does it all uh, with over 28 years of law enforcement experience. Paul, you guys ever going to catch this person or these people, do you think? I think there's a good possibility. It really is going to depend on whether or not somebody's willing to come forward and give give LAPD the information that they that they need. Um, but the as Pat said, the whole purpose of this is to get it out there and hopefully um, touch somebody that uh, has some information that'll be of use. Hmm. I'm just going back here. You know what? Everyone's right, and I'm wrong because I'm getting yelled at. It is 9,000 unsolved cases. Carm, you have a better memory than me. I stand. I if, will you, if you listen, if you listen to the beginning of the show, you will see 
I said more 10,000 and you said 9,000. Carm, you're 100% right. You are sharper than me. Uh, by the way, this is the petition to sign uh, for Ellen Greenberg. And uh, this is true. Carm is a Leo. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, Julie Fru says justice for Ellen, justice for Brett Cantor, and Jazzy Boop giving us a sticker. Thank you so much. A super sticker. Appreciate thank that. You. Love you, America. Love you, Los Angeles, love California, you, where I'm going next week. And love you, Tel Aviv, Israel, well, where karma is coming from. Uh, everyone hang on for one sec. Till next time. Tomorrow night, 7 p.m., Brian Koberger. Be here. Be square. <laughs>